Good Sunday morning and welcome to the September 3rd, 2023 edition of the Pastor's Porch. I'm Pastor Brian Schmidt, Pastor of Calvary Alliance Church in Hiawassee, Georgia. And isn't it incredible that it is already the first Sunday in September? It's like, where is 2023 going? It's crazy. But anyway, the year is almost gone, it seems. But I'm glad that you're here and that you're watching this video. Now, have you ever lent something to anybody uh, only to have that person lose, break, misuse, maybe not even return that item, whatever it might have been? Think about that for a moment. Maybe it was a, a piece of lawn equipment, you know, a, a, a lawnmower or a rake or a shovel or something like that. Maybe it was a, a piece of clothing. Uh, ladies, you know, sometimes borrow, lend uh, sweaters and jewelry and stuff like that. Maybe a book. Uh, I really enjoy books and I know that uh, there's been times I've lent a book to somebody and haven't gotten it back or it could be a vehicle even. Who knows? But I bet there have been times where you have lent something to somebody and then only have that person lose it, break it, misuse it, or maybe not even return it. Now, how did that make you feel when that happened? Or if it hasn't happened, but use your imagination, how would that make you feel? All right. Uh, you probably makes you a little disappointed in the person. It could make you a little angry, upset, uh, all different kinds of emotions. Now, think about that for a moment. And then I want to ask this question. Could it be guilty? Could it be that we are guilty of misusing something that we have that belongs to God? Think about that. For a moment peter addresses that issue in our text for today as we're going to the book of first peter we're in first peter chapter 1 verses 17 through 21 first peter chapter 1 verses 17 through 21 where peter says this he says and if and that little word if there it's better to say sense all right in the in the usage and in the greek there uh, in Colossians, it says, there's a verse in the King James that says, if you be crucified, and, and it's better if it's sense, all right? And sense, all right? And sense, you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. And the word there for fear in the Greek is phobos, all right? We get our English word phobia from that, all right? Uh, verse 18, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but you were redeemed, a little paraphrase there, you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. What a neat passage of scripture. This morning, I just want to make three points and I think they're going to be quick points today. And the first point is that uh, before we are saved, we are slaves to sin. It says there in verse 18, knowing that you are not redeemed. All right, that word redeemed has different meanings. It has the meaning of to release by paying a ransom. It also has the meaning of to restore something back into the possession of its rightful owner. And then this one, to, re to rescue from the power and possession of an alien possessor. All right, I has the idea that of buying back that there's something that has been taken something that has been stolen something that has been kidnapped something that has been misappropriated just like that item perhaps that you lent out earlier that we talked about in the introduction but it has the idea though too here that if we are redeemed which it says there that we are redeemed it means that first of all we were captives somehow, some way. And for the illustration today, the sense of the passage today, I'm going to say that we were slaves. All right. We were not free. We didn't have the freedom that we should have as individuals, but we were slaves. We were captives. We were spiritual slaves. We were the property of Satan. We were property of sin. 
We are, we are slaves of death. And as such, we are spiritually helpless. We're spiritually dirty. We're spiritually naked. And, and I had the picture in my mind of a slave in a slave market back in Peter's day. That uh, all these people milling around and here's a slave up on a, a platform or some sort being auctioned off. And, and they're up there and, and, and they were. They were naked. They were dirty. They were unclean. And, and, and they were helpless. And, and we stand there, as it were, on the block being sold we are spiritual slaves and, and we're worthless we're embarrassed we're hopeless there's nothing that we can do in and of ourselves and you know what that's true of everybody everybody who's born everybody who's a human is this nobody is different nobody is more spiritual than anybody else because peter says there Call in the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work. We're all on the same uh, box, as it were. All right. We are all sinners from the greatest sinner to the greatest saint. All right. You think about people who have lived in the greatest sinner. You know, you think maybe names like Hitler comes to mind or Stalin. All right. And, and you know what? They, they were spiritual slaves, but so was Mother Teresa. So was Billy Graham. All right, we are all sinners from the greatest sinner to the greatest saint. Romans 3 23, very familiar verse says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And you know what? We cannot save ourselves. There's no way we can buy ourselves out of that spiritual slavery. All right, we can't save ourselves. We can't do it by money. Peter says there, you're redeemed not with corruptible things like silver or gold. It doesn't matter how much money you may have. You're still a spiritual slave. And he says, uh, we can't save ourselves by religious tradition. That's what he says there, uh, corruptible things. And he says, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. All right. Uh, so it's not of works. Paul said in Titus 3 verse 5 not by works of righteousness and so we are all slaves to sin we're slaves to Satan we're slaves to spiritual death forever and ever and there's no way that we can save ourselves these other things money religious tradition other things Peter says that they're corrupt all right that word means that they're subject to decay disintegration even death they're corrupt I, I can't help but think uh, it, the lights the power goes out the electricity goes out and it's like wow I need to get a flashlight and you go rummaging through the junk door you drawer you have a junk drawer at home I bet you do and, and you look in there for that flashlight and you find the flashlight and it's this flashlight you haven't used for years and you go to click it on and nothing happens. It's like, oh, the batteries must be dead. And you, in the darkness, maybe you have a candle or something, I don't know. Uh, but you screw the top off there and you look at the batteries and, ooh, have you done this before? All right, the batteries are all corroded and nasty and it, they've lost their power. But they're nasty, they're corrupted, they're corroded. I, that's the picture I get of what our things look like when we try to save ourselves, things like silver and gold and this stuff. And, and, and Peter says also that it's, it's aimless, all right? Your aimless conduct, that word aimless means empty, vain, worthless, of no account, all right? And, and so there's no way, there's no way that we can save ourselves, not by money, not by religious tradition. These things are corrupt, these things are aimless, but we need to be redeemed. We need to be brought out of our slavery. We can't do it ourselves. And perhaps you've tried to do it yourselves. But we cannot pay the price for our redemption. Why? Because the price is too high. Ezekiel 18.4 says, The soul that sins, it will die. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. All right? And we're all going to die. But only a sinless, perfect sacrifice can buy us back from the slavery to Satan's sin and death. And so that's our first point today. We are slaves to sin and there's no way we can redeem ourselves. The second point though is praise God that Jesus paid the price. 
Jesus paid the price to redeem us out of slavery. And Jesus loved you so much in spite of your wretchedness. Jesus loved me so much in spite of my wretchedness that he paid the ransom price. Peter says that here in verse number 19. He says, again in verse 18, knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things, but 19, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Praise God, Jesus died for us. Christ died for us. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for you. Hey folks, Jesus is the only one that can buy you out of your slavery to sin. Jesus died for you. He paid the price to buy you back from the slavery of sin. And praise God, Jesus is. Four things that Jesus is that Peter tells us here. First of all, Jesus is perfect. He says there, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot there in verse 19. That word blemish has the idea of an imperfection from within. Uh, uh, you were born with that blemish. Remember back in the Old Testament, uh, the Israelites were told to offer sacrifices. They were uh, to cover sin. It, it didn't take away the sin. It just covered the sin temporarily. But the lambs that they were supposed to use were to be without blemish. That means the lamb could not have some kind of physical defect that it was born with. But then he also says here that uh, lamb without blemish and without spot, the idea of spot there has the idea of an imp imperfection from without, uh, something that has caused a stain from without. All right. And, and so Jesus Christ here, he was the perfect sacrifice. He was without blemish. He was, he was perfect from within. He was without spot. He lived a perfect life here on earth. And as such, he was the perfect sacrifice, ready and willing to die on the cross for our sins. Jesus is perfect. The second thing is he is precious. It says there with the precious blood of Christ, precious. The idea of being of value, of great price, of honor. And in the book of Revelation, when it talks about the, the new city of Jerusalem, it talks about the foundation walls and, and the things in it. And very often, five or six times, it talks about the preciousness, all right? It, it's of value, it's of worth. And Jesus is precious, Jesus is of worth. And the blood of Christ that saves us from our sins is more precious than anything here on earth. The blood of Christ is more precious than the most luxurious sports car. All right. I don't know what the most expensive sports car is. I hear things about Bentleys and Maseratis and, and those kinds of things. And some of those cars are thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, more than I can imagine. But the blood of Christ is more precious than any luxurious sports car. The blood of Christ is more value, more precious than the most elegant of mansions. And here in Hiawassee, we're about two hours from Ash. Ville, North Carolina. And in Asheville, North Carolina, there is the Biltmore Estate, a huge mansion uh, built by the Vanderbilt family years and years and years ago. And I've never been there, but I know a lot of people that have, and they say it's incredible. It's incredible. And no wonder it's incredible, still incredible because of the admission price they charge to get in there, from what I understand. But the blood of Christ that saves us from our sin is more precious than the most luxurious sports car. It's more luxurious than the Biltmore Mansion, and it's most uh, of more. It's more precious than even the most dear of human relationships that we have. All right, the precious blood of Christ. Jesus is perfect. He's precious. He was promised. All right. He said there in verse number twenty, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world. And the idea here of this word promised of of this foreordained it has the idea of a building being built according to the blueprints the blueprints are laid out and the and the contractor takes those blueprints and he knows exactly how to build that building in a way that building is foreordained it's laid out in the blueprints and, and that's the same uh, of jesus being the sacrifice for sin it was in god's plan from eternity past that he would demonstrate his love for us by dying for us to redeem us from spiritual slavery. Sometimes the question is asked, well, why did God create this world if he knew it was going to be so sinful? 
Why did God create this world if he knew that his son was going to die on the cross? And the answer is very simple, yet very profound. It was, he did it to prove his love. It says that God is love. And it's like, yeah, we believe that with all our hearts. God is love. But how did God prove this? He proved it by sending his son to be our savior. Jesus is perfect. He's precious. He's promised. And then I like this one. He is present. Not a present, but present. It means he's here with us even right now. Verse 20, again, Peter said, he was manifest in these last times for you. That word manifest means to make visible, to make clear, to make known, to make apparent. All right. It has the idea of turning the light on. All right. And it's like, oh, duh, I get it now. And Jesus came. He, he, he was present in a physical body to make manifest God himself so that we could know who God is through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, by coming to earth to die for us, has turned the light on, revealing the incredible love of God for his lost and dying creation. And, you know, in speaking about being present, you know, Jesus is with us today through his spirit. Even as I do this video, Jesus is with me here through his Holy Spirit. As you're watching this video, wherever it is that you're watching this video, Jesus is with you right now. And, and he is here and he's not quiet. He's here in his Holy Spirit. But he's talking to you. He's, he, he's pleading with you. And, and he wants you Two things. First of all, he wants you to believe in him. If you've never done that, he wants you to believe in him. Verse 21, Peter said, Who through him, Jesus, believe in God. All right? Jesus wants you to believe. He wants you to believe that he came to earth being 100% man and 100% God. I can't explain it, but that's the miracle of the virgin birth. All right? You need to believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay the price for your sin, to redeem you from Satan and from sin and death. And you need to believe that he was buried and he rose again to prove that he has victory over Satan, sin and death. And believe that Jesus is alive today to intercede for those who believe in him. Jesus is here. He's present and he wants you to believe in him. But secondly, he also wants you to call on the Father. Going back up to verse 17, it says, and if, or since you, what? You call on the Father. All right. Romans 10, 13 says, for whoever will, what? Call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I want to encourage you today, make that call. It tells us in the book of James that even the demons believe and tremble, but yet they are fallen spirits without redemption. All right. They believe, but they can't make that call. And, and so, yes, I want you to believe. I want you to put your faith in Jesus, but then you need to demonstrate that faith. You need to demonstrate that belief by making the call and asking Jesus to save you from your sin. It's kind of, and I've used this illustration before and I can't hold it up because it's right here. Uh, I'm using my cell phone to make this video, but it's like, we believe that if something happens, we're in a group of people and somebody is sick, somebody's having a heart attack, somebody's having a stroke, maybe somebody has an injury, they break a leg, maybe you come upon an accident as you're driving and there's people who are hurt and need help. And, and we believe, all right, we believe, we know it up here that this thing here, if I get my cell phone out and I call 911, that help will come, the paramedics will come, the firefighters will come, uh, and, and they're going to be able to help us. All right, I believe that, but until I actually make the call, it's that belief is no, of no value, of no worth. And so Jesus is present today, and he wants you to believe in him, and he wants you to make that call. All right, so praise the Lord. We're slaves to sin, but praise God, Jesus paid the price. We must call on him. But you know what? The third point today is that we must live for Jesus all right, we must live for Jesus. He has paid the price for your soul. You belong to him. He has paid the price to redeem you out of slavery, all right, to redeem you from Satan and, and, and sin and death. But because he has redeemed you, you are now his property and you must now live for Jesus. First Corinthians six nineteen through 20 says, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Galatians 4, 6 tells us that's the spirit of Jesus Christ himself. All right. 
You Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who's in you, whom you have from God? Get this, and you are not your own. You don't belong to yourself. You are not your own man. You are not your own woman. You are not your own person to do what you want to do. For you were bought with a price, that price being the very precious blood of Christ. Therefore, glorify God. All right, glorify, praise God, magnify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So Peter says, since you have called on the Father, he says in verse 17, he says, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. All right, conduct yourselves in a manner that brings honor and glory to God. Conduct yourselves, live your life in a way that demonstrates fear of God, a reverence of God. All right, and, and, and it's really interesting that word conduct means to actually, and, and it, it's not, um, I'm trying to think what I was going to say. It, it's a verb, all right, conduct. It, it's not your conduct, the noun, but it's a verb here, conduct, all right? It has the idea of overturning. Get this, it has the idea of turning back. It has the idea of turning upside down. It means that you're going to live differently because Jesus is your Lord and Savior. It has the idea of a drastic change, right? It has the idea of, and somebody wrote this, to turn around from living like the world in order to live for Jesus. And then he says that we're to do this throughout the time of our stay here, all right? The length of your stay. And it's really neat because this is a theme that we're seeing in the book of 1 Peter. It has the idea of your of a sojourn. It has the idea that this stay here is temporary. It has the idea that we're foreigners here, that we're just passing through. We're those ducks out of water, all right? And, and, and so Peter says, conduct yourself admirably here. Conduct yourself in a way that brings honor and glory to Jesus here during your stay here. But remember, your stay here is temporary. It's not long term. Now, why work for temporary things here, which will be of no consequence when we are going to live in heaven forever and ever? Why do we spend so much time and effort on stuff here when our stay here is just, we're just passing through? Now, years ago, Back when Debbie and I pastored a little Baptist church up in Elgin, Illinois, I had to work at, well, I had the opportunity. Let me put it that way. I had the opportunity to work at a McDonald's in the morning shift. I'd get up, I'd be at McDonald's at five o'clock and, and I would open up, I'd get everything ready for the day. And, and then until nine o'clock, from the time the store opened till nine o'clock, I worked the front counter. And that was always a lot of fun because we had a high school uh, across the street. And, and so there was a, that, brief 15 30 minute chaos when all the high school students were coming in to get their sausage biscuits and stuff and then we also had the the senior citizen population that would come in and uh they'd get their senior coffee and sometimes the the senior ladies would say you know i'd like a senior coffee please and i'd have to say oh i have to see your id uh you don't look old enough to be a senior and they oh you're so sweet anyway but i had this opportunity to work at mcdonald's and and, and i remember though that there was this one younger kid that worked there too. And and it just drove me nuts. And I'm gonna tell you why it drove me nuts because my mom and dad, and hey mom, say hi to mom here. But they taught me that when I had a job that I was to work at that job, all right? And if, if everything was done at the job, I needed to find something else to do. I needed to find something to keep me busy because I was there to work. Well, obviously this kid's parents didn't teach him that because when we didn't have customers at the front counter, he would just kind of lean back and take it easy. Or he would take those little syrup, and I should have brought one with me, all right? The little syrup packets that you get at McDonald's with their hot cakes, he'd take those and he would stack them and make little pyramids and stuff. And, and it's like, oh man, it's like, kid, hey kid, you know, you know, wipe down the tables, uh, restock the cups, you know, find something to do, right? But he, he, he was just, just kind of existing he was there to work, but no, he just took it easy. But how many times are we spiritually stacking syrup where we're just kind of lollygagging here on this earth? How often are we living for ourselves instead of for Jesus? How often are we focused on earthly things rather than heavenly things? How often are we laying up treasures here on earth rather than 
treasures in heaven? How often are we doing of things of no value here on earth instead of doing things that are of eternal value up in heaven? We're just stacking syrup. And so this is only right. This is only right that Jesus gave his life for us. We should give our lives back to him for whatever he would have us to do. Now, there's a movie I like to watch. It's one of our favorites. It's been a little while since we've watched it, <clears throat> but it's called The Count of Monte Cristo. And it's based on the novel, The Count of Monte Cristo, written in the early 1800s by Alexander Dumas. And uh, But the story is about uh, a guy named Edmund Dantes. And uh, he, he was falsely accused of a crime, of, of conspiring with, Nap with Napoleon, and it's set in France, and so he is thrown into the Chateau d'If, all right, a very terrible uh, prison indeed, uh, on an island, a desolate island right off the coast of Italy. But and he goes there, but after many years, he escapes. And, and after he escapes, he swims across the, the bay, he lands on the shore, and there he falls in with the pirate Luigi Vampa. And I'm not sure if I'm saying that right or not, Luigi Vampa. And, and as soon as he gets caught by the pirate Vampa, he is forced to fight Jacopo, one of the pirates that has fallen out of favor with Vampa. It's like, I don't know what he did. He took some of the treasure for himself, and so uh, Vampa's not really happy with him. And so what he do Vampa does is he says, all right, uh, you, he didn't know what the guy's name was, but Edmund, you're going to fight Jacopo to the death. And Edmund... He, he was training in prison, well, anyway, long story short. Uh, he beats Jacopo, and he knocks Jacopo down, and he has the knife, and he's holding the Jacopo to the knife to Jacopo's throat, but he spares his life. And he tells Pirate Vampa, he says, hey, look, you know, what's the purpose of me killing this guy, all right? Uh, I've beat him, and uh, if I kill him, you only have one guy, but if, if I let him live, then you got two guys. And the pirate's like, oh, okay, you know, no big deal. And so while Edmund is on top of Jacopo with a knife, Jacopo whispers up there to Edmund, he says, I swear on my dead relatives and even the ones who aren't feeling too good. I am your man forever. <laughs> and it's wonderful. What a neat thing. I love that story. All right. But you know what? Jesus gave his life to redeem us from slavery to sin and death. And so we should be his people, his man, his woman forever all right our desire should be to live for him to please him to serve him and, and since we have believed in him and called on him you know what our lives belong to him we are to be his people forever now praise god we are redeemed from slavery to satan sin and death by the blood of our perfect precious promise and present jesus but we are not redeemed to live our lives on our own terms and in our own ways no we belong to jesus and we are to serve him. We are redeemed to represent Jesus and to represent him well. This is the Jesus way. In fact, back over in Mark chapter 8, when Jesus was here on this earth, it says, when he had called the people to himself with his disciples, and if you put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are a disciple of Jesus today. He said to them, to his disciples, he said this, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, all right? Deny himself, say no to self. It's not about me, it's all about Jesus. And take up his cross. Now that doesn't mean literally you gotta go out and find a cross. Some people would do that figuratively and some people take it to the extreme and think they're supposed to do it uh, for real all the time. But it has the idea of death to self, all right? That's what it has there. Take up his cross, death to self, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. And get this, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Ah, glory to Jesus. All glory to Jesus. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's not about how I want to live my life. It's not about how you want to live your life. It's all about being the people of Jesus. We are his people forever. He has redeemed us from sin. He's redeemed us from Satan. He's redeemed us from death. 
we belong to him for whatever he wants us to do for his honor, for his glory. Are you serving him today? And then another question is, have you been born again? Have you put your faith in Jesus? If not, please do that today. I'm going to give you my email in just a moment. And if you have any questions, I want you to email me so that we can talk about that. Father God, thank you for Jesus. We thank you that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, that he rose again. He is alive in heaven today. He's making intercession for us before your throne. Thank you for Jesus. But Lord, help us. Lord, those who have wa are watching this video, if they've never put their faith in you, Lord, I pray that they would believe and that they would make the call and put their faith in you. Most of us, though, watching this video are. We've been born again. We're a part of your family. We have been redeemed from sin and Satan and death uh, by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, help us to remember again that we don't belong to ourselves. We belong to you. You have purchased us for yourselves. And so, Lord, help us to honor you. Help us to live for you. Help us to please you in everything that we do, everything we say, everything we think. Lord, you have redeemed us to represent you. May we represent you well, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good stuff there today. All right, I told you I was going to share you my email with you. There it is, bkschmidt at g bkschmidt65 at gmail.com. Love to hear from you. If you have any questions about what we talked about today, if you'd like prayer for anything, if you'd like to talk about what it means to be born again and how you can know for sure you have eternal life, please, please, please email me. All right. Uh, our church, Calvary Alliance Church, we're located on Highway 76 East in Hiawassee, Georgia, up in Towns County. And we are located in the uh, Chateau Harbor Plaza right across, across from the Towns County Schools. Uh, here's our website, calvaryalliancechurch.com, if you'd like to see more about our church. And then this is what we're a part of. We're a part of the Christian and Missionary Alliance and cmalliance.org. encourage you to go there. Wonderful, wonderful uh, movement of people that have a desire to exalt Christ and to make Christ known even to the most hardest parts around the world. Sunday morning worship, 1030, nothing fancy as always, just family. Looking forward to a great service this Sunday. We have our Tuesday morning ABF going through the book of Revelation. We're in Revelation chapter 13. We're talking about the beast that comes up out of the sea, the Antichrist, some scary stuff. So I'm like, wow, I'm glad I'm not going to be here. Lord willing uh, for that but uh, 927 in the fellowship hall and then on Wednesday we have our prayer meeting 6 o'clock encourage you to come pray with us and if you're not able to come pray with us but you'd like us to pray for you again send those prayer requests bkschmidt65 at gmail.com kind of loud in the neighborhood today I hope you've been able to listen to the, the sermon have the hummingbird feeders I think I've heard the hummingbirds zooming by uh, it's really neat to have them around. But God bless. Have a great week. We'll talk to you again next week.